give you a little more feeling for these mixed motives and talk about this Lie algebra whose representations they are supposed to be. But first of all, I promised uh, polylogarithms. So um, let's uh, begin with a little bit more about hot structures. Let me remind you, I, I, the one example I gave um, was the first relative cohomology group. And this was an extension This was an extension. And in fact, the X group in the category of mixed Hodge structures between Z and Z of 1 is isomorphic to um, a multiplicative group of complex numbers. And this particular extension, if you calculate the class, is exactly um, so the class of this H is equal to the x as a, as a complex number. Now, as, here's a somewhat more elaborate mixed Hodge structure. Um, let me write, first of all, let me write box n for the product of n copies of p1 minus 1. And this contains what I write Sn minus 1, the sort of the, the sphere, really the cube. This is the locus where at least one coordinate is equal to either 0 or infinity. And let's fix a, an x in, in C cross, and let's assume that x is not equal to 1. And let me write c sub x for the following curve. I'll write it as a parameterized curve. It's the locus of all points t, 1 minus t, 1 minus x, t inverse for t in p1. Actually, what I have in mind is not quite that. It's that intersect box. Three, in other words, where, where one of the, at least one of the coordinates. I mean, where I remove the locus where one of the coordinates is one. Um, then I can look at the cohomology of box three, and I'll remove the locus of points x cross box two, just the singleton set x cross arbitrary second and third coordinates. And I'll also remove the locus of this Cx. And I'll view this as relative to S2. Well, I won't write it, but I actually, what I mean is relative to S2 minus wherever this removed locus meets S2. And I'll take, the again, the Betty cohomology, but I'll shift the Hodge structure by 2. As, uh, as indicated. And if you do the calculation, it's a little painful, but um, what comes out is that this is a group of uh, rank 3. It's a free abelian group of rank 3. And it's a mixed Hodge structure. And the graded pieces are z of 2, z of 1, and and z. Oh, well, actually, we're, let's we'll work over. Oh, q. So q of two, q of one, and and q. Uh, and this is one of these uh, uh, Tate mixed Hodge structures. And as I suggested the other day, 
when that happens, we can sort of describe the mixed high structure by a matrix where this will be a rank 3 mixed high structure, so it's a 3 by 3 matrix and the matrix for this one looks like 1 log 1 minus x L2 of x log um, 2 pi i 2 pi i log x 0, 0, 0 and here comes 2 pi i quantity squared, where L2 of x is the sum of x to the n divided by n squared. It's the die logarithm. And I'll just remind you what this means. That um, what this means is that these columns, I think of C3 as a space of column vectors, I give it two filtrations. The F filtration is star 0, 0 included in star, star 0 included in star, star, star. And the weight filtration is uh, 0, 0, star. 0, star, star, and star included. Sorry. And star, 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 yeah. And I need to describe a rational structure uh, on this three-dimensional vector space for which this weight filtration is rational. And the rational structure will have as basis the indicated vectors. So. Uh, 1 log 1 minus x L2 of x comma 0 whatever 2 pi i and 2 pi i log x and 0 0 2 pi i squared form a q basis for h h q okay. and I should add that I did this calculation rather quickly. I may be off by a linear fractional transformation on the x. So maybe as an exercise, if you're interested in such things, you could try your hand and see if you get the same answer. Um, now, the point is that these examples are examples of mixed hot structures. And what I want to, the, the idea of motives is they should be sort of universal cohomologies. So they should specialize or have realization. So behind each of these things, there should be a, a, a motive. And what I suggested was that there should be this Lie algebra, which would be a graded Lie algebra, a graded Lie algebra such that mixed motives um, should be um, uh, graded finite dimensional. This is a Lie algebra over over Q, and mixed motives should be finite dimensional graded representations of of this L. This is now I lost in the notation is the, the geometry, which is specified by a field f. And you should think of f as being the function field of some variety over whose sort of, and mixed motives should be thought of as like variate germs of Zariski variations of mixed motives over this over this variety, in the sense that if we were talking about Hodge structures, the corresponding theory would calculate variations, or Zariski germs of variations of mixed Hodge structure. So really, uh, you should think of this as being sort of variations of mixed motives. I mean, I just, that's just a, to 
that may clarify things a little further down the pike. What I mean by this is, when I say mixed motives here, I mean what would correspond to variations of mixed Hodge structure. Yeah, but you see, you've got to you've got to develop this sort of schizophrenic point of view. We don't know what mixed motives are, so we frequently appeal to an approximation which is mixed Hodge structures. And so, okay, so but not to worry. In these cases, I'm thinking my field to be C, and there's no variation involved. It's, it's a punctual. So maybe I shouldn't have. This is maybe a refinement that just confuses you at this point. But not to worry. Just think of a point. Think of C. Um, yeah, so what I was getting at is that these mixed Hodge structures, uh, we'd like them to come from motives. In other words, um, in other words, what? Well, there should be, in fact, there is, this is been worked out, the mixed Hodge structures Tate mixed Hodge structures do correspond to uh, finite dimensional graded representations of a Lie algebra, of a graded Lie algebra L sub M T H, let's say. That, that's true. That's been worked out. This is a sort of a free Lie algebra on a whole lot of stuff. Um, and so what one expects, although this I don't know at this point, one expects there should be a natural map from L M T H to this to this L. I sort of know how it should go, but I haven't worked out the details, in such a way that if I have a representation to some graded vector space, so a, a, a mixed motive, then by composition, I get, so this guy then corresponds to a mixed motive, a mixed tape motive, and this guy corresponds to a mixed Tate Hodge structure. Okay, so that's what it means, a realization. All the various cohomology theories, their mixed Tate avatars correspond to graded Lie algebras, and all these graded Lie algebras go mapping into this L. Okay? So uh, therefore, if these examples, which are certainly mixed Hodge structures, are going to come from mixed motives, then we'd like our L, we'd like to get some representations that they should correspond to. Okay. Um, so let's look at, let's just look a little bit at what that might mean. So, so let me write M equals m1 plus and so on for the just the linear dual of L. Now, there's something I'm sort of pushing under the rug here. The, really, this is sort of a pro object because of problems with infinite dimensionality. And this is the corresponding end object. But you really don't lose anything by thinking of this m as just being just, just big vector spaces. These will be infinite dimensional vector spaces. but uh, on the M side, you can just think of them as just vector spaces. So therefore, a representation of L, so a representation of L is just like we can think of it as a matrix with coefficients in M. And the key thing about these coefficients is they have to satisfy a condition so that the map is compatible with the, with the Lie algebra bracket and the associative bracket here. Uh, so, for example, let's look at the example. Remember, I wrote down this uh, 
I keep writing Z. Uh, for purposes of this discussion, we should take we should take Q. So what? Um, so what to say here? Um, just formally, what can we say? Uh, this should correspond to a two-dimensional representation of our Lie algebra. And because of this filtration here, the two-dimensional representation is going to be specified as follows. It's going to look like that, where x is going to be an m in m1. Okay. x is going to be in m1. Now notice that the bracket operation on a graded Lie algebra is compatible with the gradient. It's of degree 0. So therefore, um, there, what, am I, what am I trying to say? Uh, the, um, I want to claim that dual to the bracket, maybe let me say it this way, dual to the bracket, I have a map delta from m to wedge 2 of m. And then maybe I should also mention that it's sort of a historical accident that Lie algebras were defined the way they, they were. It's really much nicer to think of them dually, because this sort of curious Jacobi identity just becomes the statement that if I dualize the bracket and then extend that map to a derivation on the exterior algebra of the linear dual, so I get a delta here to wedge 3 of m, that the composition here is 0. Okay. So the, the fact that L is a Lie algebra gives me this, this structure, right, which is sort of nice from a certain point of view. So in particular, you see, in degree-wise, m1 here necessarily has to go to 0, because there's nothing of degree 1 here. Because this thing starts with m1, and wedge 2 would necessarily get you up to at least degree 2. So that means that m1, viewed as elements in the linear dual of L, necessarily kill commutators. So it means that if I have an A in m1, then I view A as a map from L to Q, it necessarily factors through L modulo commutators. Okay, It necessarily factors that way. In other words, this map, which is a priori just a linear map, is actually a homomorphism of Lie algebras, where I give Q the trivial Lie algebra structure. Now, with that in mind, that statement is equivalent to saying that, in fact, for any x in M1, this matrix, viewed as a map from L to N of Q, direct sum two times, is a homomorphism of Lie algebra. You just think about it. This is, this is necessarily a homo of Lie algebra. So what are we, where are we now? We haven't gotten to the interesting example, but for this sort of baby example, we had these extensions, and the only ones we could think of were parameterized by the points on P1 other than 0, 1, or infinity. So it's natural, to, and we could throw in the split extension and make it correspond to 1. And so it's sort of natural then to think we know that the mixed Hodge structures are parameterized by the extensions of those are parameterized by C cross. Well, it's natural to think of, if we're working with some field F, it's natural to think of that the motivic guys should be parameterized by F cross. So that whenever I had a homomorphism from my field F to C, I would get a realization of my of these guys there. So that leads to the idea that I should define 
one should define. So this suggests that M1 should be defined by just F cross, well, tensor Q. Okay. Because why is that? On the one hand, we see that any element in M1, M1 is exactly the elements in M1 exactly correspond to this kind of two-dimensional uh, representation of the Lie algebra with this, with this kind of grading. Okay? And on the other hand, uh, the only ones we can think of geometrically are those that come from F cross. So we'll take that as axiom. Okay, now what about M2? Okay, well let's look at the example that we have. Now here's a three-dimensional representation. So here's a three-dimensional representation. So let's call this example something. Let's call it, uh, what should we call this example? Call this, uh, I don't know, script age. Okay. Uh, so script H is a three-dimensional representation. So it's going to look like uh, it's going to be given by something like this, something sort of 0, A, B, 0, 0, C, 0, 0, 0, sort of, where A and C belong to M1, and B should belong to M2. Okay. That will give us, uh, and now what's the condition that this has to satisfy in order to be a representation? Well, let me put it over here. So I'll have this guy, 0, A, B, 0, 0, C, 0, 0, 0 as a map from L to N of Q direct sum three times uh, with the grading, the obvious grading that each copy gets a weight 0, 1, 2. Um, and the condition that this should be a homomorphism is essentially the following, that if I look at the bracket, the associative bracket of the matrix I'll give myself two elements in here, let's say L1, L2, and if I look at the associative bracket, A of L1, B of L1, 0, 0, C of L1, 0, 0, 0, bracket 0, A of L2, B of L2, 0, 0, C of L2, 0, 0, 0, Uh, then that should be equal to, this is what we need in order to get a representation, that should be equal to the matrix 0, A of L1 bracket L2. Remember, these A, B, and C are elements in the linear dual, so that kind of thing makes sense. B of L1, L2, 0, 0, C of L1, L2. 0, 0, 0. Right? But now the A and the C we take to be in M1, and we precisely saw that the boundary map on M1 was 0. So boundary of M1 equals 0 for reasons of degree, because it would go to wedge 2, and there's nothing of degree 1 in wedge 2. And that says that elements in M1 are, are trivial on commutators, as I pointed out. So therefore, this guy and this guy are both 0. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if you do the calculation up here, you find that this fellow is sort of a whole bunch of zeros. But the, the, the upper corner here is maybe A of L1, uh, C of L2, minus uh, C, uh, A of whatever, A of L2. C of L1, 
and, and everything else is zero. And so the condition then becomes that um, that this term should equal uh, this one, or in other words, that the boundary of B, which is in uh, which is in wedge two of M of degree two. So I'm here looking at the map from M two to wedge two of M one, which we've agreed to identify with wedge two of F cross M sub Q. Uh, that the boundary of B in this wedge two here. Uh, applied to a L1 wedge L2, thought of, think of the wedge 2 here as the dual to the, as in the dual space. Um, don't let me not write square brackets, it looks funny, let me write round brackets. That this should be equal to A of L1, C of L2, minus A L2, C of L1. Okay? So that's what we need in order to get a representation. So which one corresponds to, to this mixed Haas structure? Well, the idea now is, so the idea idea is uh, elements in M2 should be represented by, I mean, it'll be a little vague to begin with, I'll try and make it more precise as we go on, but should be represented by curves in box 3. In other words, affine 3 space. Okay. Now, if we take that idea, we say, well, okay, but what then is going to be this, this delta that gives the Lie algebra structure? Right? We need a map from delta from M2 to wedge 2 of M1, which we've identified with wedge 2 of F cross tensor Q. But you see, it's kind of the obvious thing, right? If we have a curve in here, and we require this curve to be in reasonably general position, we can intersect this curve with any of the various spaces. Uh, in other words, we can look at what you could write. So if we have a curve, let's say uh, gamma, well, in fact, let's take a, a formal linear combination. This is, in other words, an algebraic one cycle. on affine three space meeting faces properly, where faces mean where the various coordinates equal zero or infinity, then we can define its boundary to be the sum i equals one up to three of minus one to the i minus one delta i zero of gamma minus delta i infinity of gamma, uh, where delta i j of gamma means restrict of, or the intersection of gamma with uh, the face uh, ti, I'll write ti for the three coordinates, equals j for j equals zero or infinity. Okay, so some sort of alternating linear combination of basically points. And of course, if I have a point, these, these faces, these guys sit inside now delta two. I've restricted one of the coordinates, so they naturally sit inside delta two. And a point in delta two, that's sort of a pair of points. And I can think of that as being uh, something like this. Now I'm leaving something a little bit out because algebraic geometers know it might be that those points are not defined over over the field F, but let's, let's not worry about that for, uh, for a while. So basically, therefore, I can think of this thing as being in wedge 2 
of f cross tensor q. Okay, so for example, suppose we try this game with the curve that I described earlier. Yeah. Projective line. Over yeah, over F. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is over F. Right. Uh, so, um, right. So let's look at the example that we, we sketched earlier. Namely, we look at C X, which is so X will be some point in X in, in F cross, which is not one. And C X is then the locus of all these T. 1 minus t, 1 minus x, t inverse guys. It's a collection of all those things. So no, it's sitting inside delta 3. So what then is the boundary of Cx? Right? Well, we've got to look at where it meets, where the various coordinates are going to equal 0 or infinity. But bear in mind that we've thrown out where the coordinates equal 1. OK, so for example, where t equals 0, 1 minus t is 1. Well, that doesn't count. And where t equals infinity, 1 minus x t inverse is 1. So that doesn't count. And you go through the, the, the thing, and there are a whole bunch of them that don't count. And it turns out the only one that counts is when t equals x, the third coordinate is 0. OK? So in fact, this is exactly up to a sign that I may be confused on, but it's up to a sign. It is t equals x, I get x 1 minus x. Or in other words, it's x wedge 1 minus x in wedge 2 of m1. OK? So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that, where is it here? It tells us that the matrix, if we believe this idea somehow, that somehow elements in M2 should be represented by these kind of curves, then the matrix, which is 0x cx, 0, 0, 1 minus x, 0, 0, 0, viewed as a as a map like that is a Lie algebra homomorphism. Okay. So this does give a map from the Lie algebra to the, so to speak, to the Heisenberg Lie algebra. Okay, so this is a Lie algebra homomorphism. And what I claim, which may or may not become clearer as the time goes on, is that this guy is the motive whose Hodge realization is the one that I, that I wrote down earlier. Okay. All right, so now uh, I propose to, um, well, let's see. Um, I propose to actually say rigorously what L is. Okay, just give me uh, a few minutes because I've really been a little vague. And, and so let me try and make some precise mathematical definitions of what L is. Okay, so more precisely. More precisely, uh, let's define VRS to be equal to co-dimension 
are algebraic cycles with rational coefficients on this affine S space, which I remind you is P1 minus 1 to the S power, um, satisfying a couple of conditions. Uh, first of all, it should meet all faces. All means not just the co-dimension one faces, but the smaller dimensional faces obtained by setting various coefficients equal to zero infinity uh, properly. Properly means just in the right dimension. There's no doesn't have to be transversal, but just properly. Uh, second condition is that um, um, the cycle should be alternating with respect to the action of the symmetric group on, on S letters, which acts on the, on the factors here. And we require the cycle alternate sign. And third condition, uh, harking back to that remark I made over here, uh, is that the intersection, so the um, intersections with faces should be absolutely irreducible as varieties over f. That's a technical condition. If you're thinking of f as the complex numbers, so that doesn't, doesn't play a role. But it's, Second point is the Sorry? What does it mean? Of the well, it means that I've cheated you here, for example, with a cx, that actually the cx isn't an element in M2, but cx minus, you know, I take the various elements of the symmetric group and for each element in the symmetric group on three letters, I have its, there's a sign associated, plus or minus one. And I add up the various translates of CX under these elements in the symmetric group with the appropriate signs. And then I divide by the order of the symmetric group. I, I anti-symmetrize. OK? So for example, in two dimensions, it would be, I would get A minus uh, the switch of A in two dimensions. In three dimensions, it's probably a little more. Maybe one half. Sorry, one half. I make it alternate. Okay? But by faces, you mean faces of this cube embedded in here? Yeah. Uh, all. Where one coordinate zero is. Yeah, but by, for three, I mean also, again, lower dimensional faces where several coordinates are, are is zero. Is this meaningless of the complex? Yeah. Everything is absolutely, uh, sorry, should be, I'm sorry, you're right, should be a sum of absolutely, absolutely, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, should be a sum of absolutely, otherwise it wouldn't be a group. No, I, I was being stupid. Right. right. Okay. Right. So, so that's this thing here. Now, next step is define n i r to be. Next step is to re-index the thing. V r two r minus i. I'm sorry about that. It's absolutely miserable for the intuition, but it's just right for the for the mathematics and. Um, and define n i to be the direct sum r greater or equal to zero of n i r. Okay. So for example, n one is the direct sum of co-dimension r cycles on this affine two r minus one dimensional space. And 
for some reason that nobody working in the subject understands, that's where the action is. Okay. Now, this. Uh, well, if it isn't, I just take zero. Right. So this, this is by convention zero if this is a negative number. Yeah. Well, this what I what I want to claim is first remark is that there that this n dot now n dot is a commutative differential graded algebra. Commutative means in the in the sign sense. And in fact, it is a graded commutative differential graded algebra. Because each ni is, is itself graded. Okay. Now notice the boundary map. I should have pointed out with regard to the v's that we have a boundary map. Again, the same formula that I wrote down over here. So there is a boundary map which maps codimension r cycles on affine s space to codimension r cycles on affine n minus s minus one space, and that's why. I include this condition one so that, and you check that this preserves the alternating, that the boundary of an alternating cycle is alternating. And uh, so this then gives a map from this n i r to n i minus one, uh, i plus one r, right? Because the what comes in here should go down, but that means that the i should go up, whereas the codimension stays the same. So that means that this curious n dot here. Also, I have a product. I have a product which maps n i tensor n j to n i plus j, which is just take the, I mean, these are cycles on cubes. And of course, I can take products of cubes and get higher dimensional cubes. And then I have to take an alternating projection. So this sends a cycle if I have an element v r s and an element v r prime s prime. Of course, I can go to v r plus r prime s plus s prime, and the game is to send a cycle a cross cycle b to the uh, alternating projection of sort of the product. OK? So this then becomes a n dot is a differential graded algebra. Now, unfortunately, it's not connected. Namely, it has stuff in negative degrees. Because negative degrees, i is negative. That's just making bigger and bigger dimensional affine spaces. So we have co-dimensions which are strictly less than half the dimension. And those are the uninteresting guys, for reasons that nobody understands. So since they're uninteresting, let's kill them. Okay. So we define j to be what? Well, we have the direct sum r less equal to minus 1 of n r plus n 0. But I don't want to take all of n 0. n 0 is what? n 0 is when i is 0 here. It's a direct sum over r. But there's the possibility that r equals 0 as well. So let me remark that n n0 is the direct sum of co-dimension r things in two r dimensions. This projects onto v0, 0, which is just q. It's co-dimension 0 cycles on a point. It's just, just q. And so I can define n0 plus to be the kernel. I mean, this is an augmented differential graded algebra, if you like. And so I have the augmentation ideal here. And uh, I want to make this a 
So I take the algebra, the, the ideal generator, take the ideal generator by, by those guys, sort of the negative stuff. Now, this is a graded ideal, but it's not closed under the differential. Negative. No, no, I'm sorry. Did I say neg no, negative R doesn't, doesn't? R is never negative. Oh, I shouldn't have called it R. Uh, I. It's the upper index. Oh, it's the upper one. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the upper. I, I, that's tricky. It's like it's like in calculus when you confuse the students <laughs> by changing epsilon to delta. <laughs> Only usually the students are so stupid they don't realize that it's happened. You know. Uh, okay, so this is a differential ideal, a graded ideal, but it's not closed under the differentiation, so we write script I to be the smallest differential ideal containing J, and in fact what it is, it's direct sum I less equal to minus 1 of N I plus N 0 plus plus the boundaries of n0 plus. This is something contained in n1, and it's the ideal generated by those things. This is a differential graded algebra ideal. It's closed under the differential. And just to finish up, we consider, since this is a, an, an ideal, we can take the quotient. We get that n modulo i is a nice connected differential graded algebra. It's Q plus N I 1 plus and so on. So, nice. so we sort of killed the minimal amount that we had to in order to get a nice connected guy. And now, how do we get a Lie algebra, or the dual of a Lie algebra is actually what we're after. We're after the M. The L will come as the dual of M. So we want, how do we get the dual of a Lie algebra from a differential graded algebra? Well, you've got to be a little careful. But the idea is this. We have a boundary map from n mod i. Well, let's first of all, let me tell you a couple of lemmas. I'm not going to prove them. There's no time. But I'll just tell you a couple of things. That, well, first thing that's true, so fact, is that if I look at wedge 2, just formally take wedge 2 of n mod i 1, it's the second wedge of this vector space, then because this is a differential graded algebra, this maps to n mod i 2. Right? And the fact is that this is actually an inclusion. Okay? And you really have to prove that. You really have to think carefully about all these ideas. This is actually, so I, what I'm going to tell you is that this is sort of somehow pretty close to being a free uh, graded algebra, as a graded algebra. Okay? So a free graded algebra would certainly have this property, and this, this has this property. And so it makes sense to look at, I'll define M to be the set of elements X in N mod I in degree 1, such that the boundary of X belongs to wedge 2 of n mod i 1, which I just told you was sitting inside n mod i 2. OK? So it says that the boundary is somehow decomposable in the sense of this algebra. And now the second fact is that if I take the differential and apply it to one of these elements, this is actually, I mean, a priori, all I could say would be that that would be contained in this wedge here. But in fact, what happened is this is actually contained in wedge 2 of m, which is contained in wedge 2 of n mod i. Am I getting out of range here? Which is contained in n mod i. Okay. So therefore, restricted to this M, I get a 
So I get the boundary from this M to which to plus M. And all the requisite properties are satisfied. Namely, if I extend to a derivation of the formal exterior algebra on this M, I get that delta squared equals zero. OK. I um, have a little more time here. Um, so by way of example, let me push the example that I gave earlier a bit further and sketch how you get the motives that correspond to the higher polylogarithms. OK, so polylog motives. So what do I want to do? I'd like to do two things. I'd like to take my lead. So I'm going to take my field F to be, to be C, although this actually, in fact, is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, M is graded. Everything, everything is homogeneous. There are two gradings going on here. This is, these guys are actually bi-graded, right? And so there's a second grading, the R, which is carried throughout the, the boundary is of, of degree zero. And so everything is comes equipped with a with a grading. Um, do you see that? I mean this is sort of way down at the bottom made up of cycles. Is that grading what's that grading is simply cycle? It's the codimension of the it's cycle. The okay, so that's it's the codimension of the cycle. Yeah. That's still there. I'll um, Okay. The one is this one is codimension, that's the R. The other is it has this screwy relationship with the dimension of the ambient affine space. For which that's I the Lie algebra grid. That's the I is the Lie algebra. I is the Lie algebra. Well, no, I mean once we're talking about Lie algebra, I is the grading in the differential graded algebra. R is the grading in the graded differential graded algebra. <laughs> Okay. So anyway, in the remaining couple of minutes, let me just sketch um, a surjection, a quotient, uh, let's call it L log, or maybe L, call it L, L polylog, a, sur, a, a quotient Lie algebra, together with, a rep, with representations, well, these representations were found by Deline, and so his notation uh, is it's n plus 1. Choose a capital N, so choose capital N. And the, this doesn't depend on the capital N, but I get one of these representations for each capital N. So these representations are due to Deline. Um, and this is should be thought of as the direct sum of n plus 1 copies of q indexed by the integers between 0 and n. OK, so how does this, how does this go? No, don't, don't think of it. This is a repre this is just a linear representation. So it's an n plus one dimensional vector space over Q. So this will be a motive then of dimension n plus one, and it will generalize the three dimensional example that I talked about earlier. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So I can think of this as Q weighted in degree zero plus Q weighted in degree 1 plus plus Q weighted in degree n. Well, you're too classical for me. Um, 
just column vectors. These are column vectors, exactly. These are column. Okay. So here we go. Um, I'll define for any integer r. I'll define rho r from the free abelian group on, well, f. But I've said f. There's really no reason. Just f is general. F minus 0, 1, just the free abelian group on these generators, into uh, M uh, R, which is built out of from co-dimension R cycles on delta 2R. Built from is sort of vague. But you get the idea. So the idea is this, let t naught, t r minus 1 be homogeneous coordinates on p and p r minus 1. Here we are projected. And consider the following cycle, v r a equals, I'll think of this as parameterized, a t r minus 1 divided by t r minus 2 divided by tr minus 1, comma, a t0 divided by tr minus 1, comma, t0 minus t1 over t0, uh, up to tr minus 2 minus tr minus 1 divided by tr minus 2. T R minus one. I'm sorry to give it in this way, but frankly, I don't have a better way to think about this thing. You just have to sort of two over it. T zero divided by T R minus one. And just sort of think of this as a parameterized thing for the varying uh, homogeneous coordinate values as sitting inside delta two R minus one. Okay, so it's an R minus one dimensional parameterized in fact, you check it's closed inside. inside. Uh, and define rho r of the class of A to be the alternating projection of this vr of A. Okay. Now, the point of this is, this is now a cycle on here. And what happens when we try to compute its boundary? Well, it's computing its boundary means setting these various things equal to 0 or infinity. Now, I'm not going to do it in front of you. but And also, there's this alternating game that goes on. But when you do it, what you find is up to a sign that I very possibly screwed up. You find, uh, blah, 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 what do you find? That this is rho r minus 1 of a. Um, Where is it? Rho, I've lost it. So to speak, wedge A, where I have to explain what I mean by that. Um, I have to think what I mean by that. First of all, I should normalize things. Rho 1 of A is 1 minus A in M1. By definition. So this, this description here starts with R. Uh, at least two, and uh, I can think of this. See, sorry, what am I saying? The boundary, the boundary of this mess is this. Remember, the boundary is going to carry me. Here, I have a cycle on delta r minus one. Its boundary will be a cycle on delta. 2r minus 2. And what I'm thinking of is that this is equal to 2r minus 2 is, let's see, it's delta 2r minus 1 minus 1 cross uh, delta 1, right? God willing? Yes. And so rho r minus 1 of a makes sense as a cycle here. And just a which I've written parenthesis A, makes sense as a cycle here. 
and the wedge means their product in the sense of the exterior algebra, I mean, the sense of the differential graded algebra, it just means their product, the alternating projection of their product, their cycles. Okay. So to finish up, um, we define M poly log to be equal to the direct sum over R of the row R of this Z, this Cartesian group, ZF minus zero one, and that is then a sub guy inside M, and this formula here tells me that 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 actually is a sub that the exterior algebra of M poly log contained in the exterior algebra on M is stable under boundary. So that that corresponds, therefore, to a quotient on the dual Lie algebra level. Okay, so I then get I get a surjection, I define L poly log to the M poly log dual, and I get L surjecting onto L poly log. And now just quickly, I'm sorry I'm a little bit over, but let me just quick finish up by telling you what the representation is uh, due to the lean of this L poly log here. We define dot the final i here. So define uh, say e0 to be the following. So now we fix n. So like greater or equal to 2 to make the thing interesting. So you take a matrix where the zeros in the first column, 0, 0, 1, zeros on down. And so on down with ones uh, in the, the first sub-diagonal row and zeros everywhere else. And this is to be capital N plus 1 by capital N. Sorry? Uh, no. Zeros in the first column. Uh, and E1 is to be 0, 1, 0, 0, and 0 everywhere else. Okay, that picks up that first column for you. <laughs> then um, take uh, So the representation then, call it M, N, and uh, uh, we'll give ourselves a, an A in uh, F cross minus zero, 1. And I want a corresponding to this, this A, I want to give myself a representation. So M, N, A then will be an element in M poly log tensor n to q 0 n and which element will it be? It will be equal to minus a tensor e 0 minus the sum from r equals 1 to capital N of rho r of a tensor add uh, power r minus 1 of uh, E0 acting on E1. And it's a simple calculation based on the boundary formula for the rows here to convince yourself that this is actually a representation of the, of the Lie algebra. So this actually gives us a representation 
L poly log goes to N Q zero. Okay, well, I mean, there's, there's much more that one could say about various realizations of this thing and so forth, but uh, I think stop. This is the cycle that I was talking about earlier. So V2 of A is what I was calling C of A, up to reparameterizing. Uh, and the point is, if you look at M2, it goes to wedge 2 F cross tensor Q, then what's the co-kernel? Well, it follows from a theorem of Suslin that the co-kernel is, in fact, the Milner K2 of F tensor Q. So that the image here is generated by the Steinberg elements, sort of x wedge 1 minus x. So that on the level of M2, that's really all that's going on. Okay, Since the CA, remember the boundary of the CA, was A wedge 1 minus A. So somehow that's all that's going on on the, on the, on the second level here. But it's not all that's going on higher up, because this L poly log is a graded Lie algebra, but it is abelian in degrees 2 or less, or minus 2 or less. So it's, whereas the, the right L should actually be a free Lie algebra in degrees minus 2 or less. So there's something, it's, there's something weird that happens, something maybe nonlinear that happens in higher, higher dimensions. It makes the Steinberg symbol really multiplicative and not just multiplicative up to some linear fraction transformation. That's the Is there another reason? Because it's supposed to untwist it and through one back out to infinity. Yeah, I would have probably. Well, then every time you turn around, does this thing look nice? The product, you see, I mean, even, even the, the group law on. See, I, there's something I've shoved under the rug here. I've given you two definitions of M1. I gave you a, a definition as F cross, and then I gave you this sort of abstract cycle theory definition. I didn't prove the two the same. And if you did, you'd find that the group law would be given by x plus y would be equal to x over 1 minus x times y over 1 minus y. And that rapidly leads to Madness. I mean, that that kind of. So it's far better to 